Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the National Ryan White Conference on HIV AIDS Care and Treatment DMAP Business Day. My name is Lieutenant Commander Lawrence Mamodu. I'm a project officer in the Southern Branch within the Division of Metropolitan HIV AIDS Program, and I'll be serving as your moderator for today. We thank you for joining us for today's session. As you view the presentation, please feel free to add your questions or comment to the chat box. My colleagues will be monitoring them throughout this presentation. Without further ado, it gives me great pleasure and honor to welcome our director, Chrissy Abrams, to kick off our business day. Chrissy? Thank you, Lawrence, and good morning, everyone. As Lieutenant Commander Momadou stated, I am Chrissy Abrams Woodland, the director for the Division of Metropolitan HIV AIDS Programs, or DMAP as we call for short. Welcome again to our first ever virtual National Ryan White Conference. So we are happy to have this time with you this morning for our Division Business Day meeting. Although it is a bit truncated from our past meetings, um, so bear with us as we squeeze as much in as we possibly could. So please note that we will have webinars scheduled throughout the coming months to provide you with more details and trainings on DMAP related activities. I do look forward to seeing and meeting each of you in person one day. But for now, we have our virtual platform, which has become our new norm. So before we get started, we would like to remind you that HRSA is on four social media platforms. We encourage you to follow along and share our content on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram to stay up to date on the latest HRSA news. Our account handle on each platform is at HRSAGov. Additionally, we encourage you to sign up for HRSA's e-news, a bi-weekly email of comprehensive HRSA news, and sign up for HRSA press releases. You can also visit our website at www.hrsa.gov for more detailed information about all of our programs. So today, you will hear from a number of our DMAP staff. As I mentioned, we do have a packed agenda. So without further delay, let's go ahead and get started. Next slide, please. So here's the agenda for our meeting today. I did warn you that it is packed. Um, however, we have some exciting and great information to share with you today. I will now turn it over to Ms. Sonia Gray, a brand, our branch chief of the Western Branch, who will get us started with our presentation. Sonia? Yes, good morning and thank you, Chrissy, and thank you, everyone. Next slide, please. The Health Resources and Services Administration Overview. It is not on the screen, you guys. El Electra. Okay, thank you. It supports more than 90 programs that provide uh, care to people geographically isolated, economically or medically vulnerable through grants and cooperative agreements to more than 30,000 awardees, including community and faith-based organizations, colleges, universities, state, local, and tribal governments, and private entities. That's what HRSA does. Every year, HRSA programs serve tens of millions of people, including persons living with HIV AIDS, pregnant women, mothers and their families, and otherwise people uh, unable to access quality health care. We are known as the Access Agency. Next slide, please. HRSA's Ron White HIV AIDS program. We, in fact, provide comprehensive system of HIV primary medical care, medication, and essential support services for low-income people with HIV. We're very proud to say that more than half of people with diagnosed HIV in the United States, nearly over 500,000 people, are served through our Ron White HIV AIDS program through the services that you guys provide each and every day, and we're so thankful. Uh, funds are, are, are grants to cities, states, counties, and local community-based organizations. Our recipients uh, determine the service delivery and funding priorities based on local needs and processes. The statutory provision, and that is the payer of last resort. Our funds, the Ron White HIV AIDS program, may not use if you have if we if you have another state or local or pardon me or federal payer available. 
87.1% of raw and white HIV AIDS clients were virtually, virtually, I knew I would say it, virally suppressed in um, 2018, exceeding the national average of 62.7%. So next slide, please, and we will pitch it over to, oh, I have one, the, our, mich, our vision and mission. Person HIV AIDS Bureau have our vision and mission that we work every day to achieve. Our vision is optimal HIV AIDS care and treatment for all. Our mission provide leadership and resources to access to retention and high quality integrated care and treatment services for vulnerable people with HIV AIDS and their families. That's our vision and that's our mission. And now I have the honor to um, uh, not pitch it over, but to offer it over to our uh, division director, Ms. Chrissy Abram Woodland. Thank you, Chrissy. Thank you, Sonia. So now that we have provided a high level overview of HRSA, the Ryan White HIV AIDS program and the HIV AIDS Bureau's mission and vision, we will now turn to our division, the Division of Metropolitan HIV AIDS Programs. For those of you who have been tuning in to our Have You Heard webinars, you are aware that DMAP has expanded and now also includes the Ending the HIV Epidemic Initiative. So I will provide more detail on this new structure in the next few slides. However, this slide provides an overview of both programs. Our Ryan White Part A program funds metropolitan jurisdictions that are most severely impacted by the HIV epidemic. The metropolitan area recipients provide optimal HIV care and treatment for people with HIV who are low income, uninsured, and underserved through comprehensive core medical and support services. The EHE initiative within DMAP focuses on 48 counties, Washington DC and San Juan, Puerto Rico, where more than 50% of new HIV diagnoses occurred in 2016 and 2017. These priority counties represent 39 Ryan White's Part A jurisdictions. Resources are provided to these jurisdictions to implement innovative strategies, interventions and approaches, and core medical and support services to reduce new HIV infections. Next slide, please. Now I would like to introduce our outstanding staff here in DMAP. So as you can see on the slide, our, as I've already introduced myself, but as you can see on the slide, the deputy director position is currently vacant but hopefully not for much longer. The division is also supported by three advisors, Ms. Helen Robito, Lieutenant Commander Andy Tesfazion, who is currently deployed right now supporting COVID-19 efforts, and an EHE advisor position, which is still under recruitment, so it's also vacant. In addition to the advisor, the Office of the Director is also supported by an administrative associate, Ms. Elaine Heck, and administrative support, Ms. Chanel Coley, and a soon to be EHE management analyst position, which is also still under recruitment. So now we have five branches in the division, three part A's and two new EHE branches, which I will go over each of these. Next slide, please. So I'll start with our part A Northeastern branch. This branch is led by Ms. May Rupert as the branch chief. Her staff consists of Ms. Christina Barney, Ms. Maureen Duarte, Mr. Kia Hudson, Ms. Deborah Medina, Ms. Sarah Morgan, and Mr. Jose Ole. So we've included each of their jurisdictions that they monitor on the slide for your convenience. Next slide. Next, we have our Part A Southern branch, which is led by Mr. Mark Pepler, the branch chief. And his team consists of Mr. Emerson Evans, Lieutenant Commander Jonathan Finner, Lieutenant Commander Eric Schell, Lieutenant Commander Lawrence Momadou, and a vacant project officer position. Again, their Part A jurisdictions are also listed on the slide for your convenience. And next slide, please. Next, we have our Part A Western branch. Ms. Sonia Gray is the branch chief, and her team consists of Mr. Lenny Green, Mr. Luigi Procopio, Commander Holly Barilla, and Lieutenant Commander Jessica Krieger, who is currently also on deployment supporting COVID-19 efforts. 
So Ms. Helen Rovito, our program advisor, is also temporarily supporting our Western branch, as well as our HRSA Pathways intern, Ms. Kathleen O'Malley. Next slide, please. Now we will move to our new EHE branches. Mr. Michael Kerrigan, who was previously a Southern Branch PO, is now the branch chief of the Eastern Branch as of last week. So congratulations, Michael, again. So we are still recruiting for the project officer positions and we'll provide you all with an update once all vacant positions are filled. However, we did list the jurisdictions that would be, um, that would be within this branch, the Eastern Branch. Next slide, please. And our last branch, but of course not least, is our EHE Midwestern Pacific Branch. This branch is by Ms. Amy Griffin as the branch chief, who was previously a project officer in our Ryan White Part B program. She too just joined us last week in her new role, so congrats again to you, Amy. And again, we will update everyone on vacancies once they are filled, so you will know which project officers would be assigned to, the, to monitor these EHE jurisdictions. Um, however, we do have a list of the jurisdictions that will reside within this branch on the slide for your convenience. Next slide, please. So here's a nice visual for you. This is a map that shows the location of our EMAs and our TGAs across the continental United States and Puerto Rico. So as you know, we have 24 eligible metropolitan areas, which are the tannish, orangish color maybe, and our 28 transitional grant areas are in blue. Next slide, please. This next slide highlights where the EHE funded jurisdictions are located within the public health service regions. So this is a nice um, graphic for you if you're trying to identify exactly where our EHE positions, uh, read, uh, EHE jurisdictions are located. And now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Mr. Michael Kerrigan who will highlight some of our EMA TGA viral suppression data. Michael? Next slide, please. Great, thanks, Chrissy. So now, as Chrissy said, we're gonna talk about some viral suppression data. Uh, the upcoming slides show data for all Ryan White uh, Part A clients in um, the following jurisdictions. And before sharing these data with you, I do want to briefly highlight client data about the Ryan White HIV AIDS program. In 2018, the program served nearly over half a million or 534,000 clients, the majority of whom were people with HIV. The Ryan White program client population accounts for more than half of all people diagnosed with HIV infection in the United States, according to HIV surveillance data. Nearly three quarters or 74% of Ryan White clients are from racial and ethnic minority populations. Approximately 61% are living at or below the federal poverty level. Now to put this in a little bit of perspective, in 2018, 100% of the federal poverty level for a family of one was $12,140 per year. And for a family of four, it was $25,100 per year. The Ryan White client population is also aging. 46% of clients in 2018 were aged 50 and over. Now we are excited to share that the Ryan White viral suppression data for 2018 continued an upward trend in viral suppression with 87.1% of Ryan White clients in medical care achieving viral suppression. That's a 17.6% increase since 2010. Next slide, please. So before we review the EMA and TGA viral suppression data, it is important to remember that 73% of people with HIV live in EMAs and TGAs. This chart shows viral suppression among key populations served by the Ryan White program's outpatient ambulatory health services in the EMAs and TGAs. It shows a side-by-side -side comparison of viral suppression for each subpopulation in 2010, indicated by a dark blue bar. And in 2018, that's indicated by a light blue bar. 
For comparison, viral suppression for all Ryan White clients overall in 2010 was 69.5% indicated by a dark green line and was 87.1% in 2018 that's marked by a light green line. This upward trend in viral suppression occurred across all key populations. However, it is important to note the challenges remain in achieving viral suppression for certain populations, as we all know. Most notably, in 2018, the client subpopulations with viral suppression lower than overall percentage of 87.1%, as the chart indicates, were Blacks, African Americans at slightly lower than 83.6%, transgender clients at 81.3%, youth aged 13 to 24 years at 75.4%, and unstably housed clients at 72.3%. Next slide, please. Now this chart shows viral suppression among key populations served by the Ryan White program overall in 2018. Um, and this chart compares Ryan White clients served overall in each key population to the clients receiving services by Ryan White OAHS providers and EMAs and TGAs specifically. As evidenced by the graphic, there are nominal differences that exist between all Ryan White clients and EMA TGA viral suppression in particular. The dotted green line indicates the overall Ryan White population viral suppression for 2018, again, 87.1%. So thank you. And now I will turn it back over to you, Chrissy, to introduce the multi-year proposal. Yes, thank you, Michael. Next slide, please. So now we have what we think is some exciting news to share. We have been exploring options over the past years to eliminate our annual application process and received approval to introduce this multi-year funding concept to you today. Next slide, please. So just a little bit of the background. So our Ryan White Part A grants, um, grant awards are comprised of three funding categories, formula, supplemental, and minority AIDS initiative or MAI funding. As you all may know, formula and MAI funds are awarded based on a relative distribution of living HIV AIDS cases in the jurisdictions. However, the supplemental funding requires the submission of an annual application in accordance with the requirements outlined in our legislation. So as we understand, here's the issue. So we truly understand that there is an administrative burden and cost incurred by both the jurisdiction and HRSA have as it relates to an annual application process. Additionally, the need, which are the specific um, demonstrated need in EHA sections in the application, um, as outlined in each application, does not change significantly in consecutive years, as program impact is incremental. However, the need component of the application comprises of two thirds of the points available for the Objective Review Committee, or the ORC score and that's outlined in our legislation. And this is a contributing factor for why the ORC scores for individual applications submitted by eligible jurisdictions show little variance in consecutive years. Furthermore, since our ORC scores from annual applications are one of several factors that determine the supplemental funding amount, the need for a competitive scored application on an annual basis may not be necessary to award supplemental funds for our party recipients. Next slide, please. So here is what we considered our proposed solution. So DMAP is planning to convert from an annual competing application model to a three-year period of performance non-competing continuation model for all components of the Part A funding. So doing so would alleviate the administrative burden and cost associated with the annual competing application model for both HRSA and jurisdictions. Moreover, this conservative three-year period of performance will help to capture and address significant changes across eligible jurisdictions that may impact ORC scores. Now in the three-year NCC model, a competing application, which is a full application that will be scored by an ORC, will be submitted in the first year of the period of performance, followed by NCC applications submitted for years two and three. 
So since an ORC score is necessary to calculate supplemental funding for each year in the three-year period of performance, DMAP is planning to use the ORC score attained with the competitive application submitted in the initial year for the second and third years of the period of performance. Now, one important note um, item to note is that all current Ryan White party requirements remain the same. So for example, recipients will be required to spend at least 95% of formula funds. If not the same formula, you will be penalty will be imposed. And that could render the recipient ineligible to receive supplemental award in a future budget period. And please note that this penalty can be imposed within or across the periods of performance. So lastly, the FY 2022 NOFO will be when DMAP will transition the annual competing application to the three-year NCC model. This means that the FY 2022 NOFO will address the fiscal years 2022 through 2024 period of performance. The fiscal year 2022 application will be the initial application that is scored by the ORC and the fiscal year 2023 and 2024 applications will be the non-competing continuation periods where an abbreviated application consistent with the requirements outlined in legislation and in addition to some predetermined programmatic components will be submitted. Supplemental funding in fiscal year 2023 and 2024 will be calculated using the ORC score attained in the FY22 application. Next slide, please. So to ensure that this new model is fair and non-disruptive, an analysis of the most recent three years of Ryan White Part A funding was performed to assess the impact of ORC scores on supplemental funding. We analyzed actual supplemental award amounts in the fiscal year 2018 through 2020 with a mock scenario where 2018 ORC scores determined the supplemental award amounts for fiscal years 2019 and 2020. The table to the right on the slide displays some summary statistics from the analysis. The first table illustrates the ORC scores during the 2018 through 2020 periods. And the second table illustrates the aggregate percent change in the final supplemental award amounts awarded to recipients in 2019 and 2020, if the 2018 ORC scores were used for the award calculation. So you'll note that in the first table, the ORC scores are consistently high and tightly. This is uh, pretty standard across our program from year to year. The second table outlines and the minimum variation in supplemental award amounts on an aggregate level if the 2018 score was used to determine the award amounts for 2019 and 2020. So some conclusions drawn from this analysis were that one, it is difficult to quantify and direct Ms. Abrams, do you know that you're, you're muted? Okay. Yes, I just realized I was uh, muted. So let me start back. I don't know at what point I was muted, but the clues, so some of the conclusions drawn from the analysis um, were that one, it is difficult to quantify the direct impact of the ORC scores on the final supplemental award amount. Two, there is not enough variation in ORC scores in consecutive years to indicate significant impact based solely on ORC scores. And three, there are other influencing factors in addition to ORC scores that contribute to a recipient's supplemental award amount. For example, priority funding, um, available appropriation amounts, the number of living cases, the, and relative distribution of cases. So it is actually the confluence of all these factors that contribute to the final supplemental amount awarded to a recipient and is ultimately the reason why it is difficult to quantify the direct impact of an ORC score on a supplemental award amount. So the bottom line is, however, the analysis demonstrated that maintaining the same ORC score for a three-year period of performance resulted in supplemental award amounts that minimally deviated from the actual supplemental award amounts determined using the ORC scores. This fact 
um, demonstrates that supplemental award amounts cannot be solely attributed to the ORC scores. Moreover, the ORC score impact is minimal when all influencing factors are considered. So for these reasons, and in addition to the consistent submission of high quality scored applications by our Part A recipients, HRSA have and DMAP conclude that transitioning to the three-year NCC model would be beneficial to recipients and ultimately the vulnerable clients we serve, as the reduction in burden will free up valuable time and resources that can be dedicated to supporting the provision of high quality services to our clients. So we hope that you are as excited about this proposal as we are. We do plan to have some webinars in the near future to further explain the details and to respond to any questions that you may have. So I'm now going to turn the presentation over to Mr. Mark Pepler, who will provide some updates from our HAB Division of Policy and Data. Mark? Thank you, Chrissy. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am again going to be, I guess, next slide, please. Yes, uh, I'm going to be reviewing some updates on some data reports and special initiatives that have occurred. Uh, and so next slide, please. Yes, so um, the Ryan White HIV AIDS program uh, data reports uh, are developed by HAB's Division of Policy and Data, uh, which we refer to as DPD. Um, while DPD collects uh, and manages and analyzes and, and disseminates this data, these reports would not happen without the diligent reporting of all of you. So thank you all. Uh, DPD is pleased to be able to share back uh, with you and to other Ryan White uh, program stakeholders the data you report to have in a, a useful format. In addition to the reports mentioned here, DPD also puts together a series of PowerPoint files that display the most recent RSR client level data for use as, uh, as you talk about the success of your programs in, in the context of the larger Ryan White HIV AIDS program. Uh, let's see here. Uh, next slide. Okay, in addition to collecting and reporting on program data, DPD also convenes technical expert panels or TEPs to explore various issues relevant to the Ryan White program and the clients we serve. I'm going to describe a series of TEPs that were recently held as well as two planned for later this year. In November of 2019, HAB convened a one-day TEP uh, to discuss the housing needs of people with HIV in the Ryan White HIV AIDS program. Panel participants represented a diverse range of uh, Ryan White HIV AIDS program recipients, mm -hmm. stakeholders with lived experience, housing service providers and experts, public health organizations and federal representatives uh, from across HRSA, uh, the US Department of Agriculture, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. The meeting focused on identifying facilitators of and barriers to housing for people with HIV and successful models or strategies for addressing housing needs. Throughout the meeting, panelists shared perspectives on best practices for fostering stable, healthy housing among Ryan White HIV AIDS program clients to support engagement in medical care and reaching viral suppression. A report on the TEP was recently released on the HAB website, uh, which can be found at the bottom of this slide. You can also find reports on other HAB-sponsored TEPs at this site. In March of this year, uh, HAB hosted another TEP to explore the HIV care needs of people with HIV in state prisons and local jails, and the role of the Ryan White HIV AIDS pro and the role the Ryan White HIV AIDS program can play in addressing these needs. The purpose of this panel was to identify supports and barriers to HIV care and treatment in correctional facilities, as well as community reentry and, uh, and current approaches and guidance under HAB's policy clarification notice PCN 1802, uh, which is the use of Ryan White HIV AIDS program funds for core medical services and support services for people living with HIV who are incarcerated or justice involved. 
20 panelists representing state and local health departments, correctional health care providers, community health based uh, health care providers, researchers, federal agencies, and national organizations identified the following through this TEP that considerations need to be given for improving HIV treatment for people with HIV who are justice involved, issues related to providing HIV care in correctional settings, issues related to ensuring access to treatment and other services during reentry, and as well as data issues. A report is forthcoming and will also be available on the HAB website. In April, a TEP was held to generate ideas and insights to guide the programmatic direction for the Ryan White HIV AIDS program, Part D program, which is Women, Infants, Children, and Youth, or WIKI. 19 people attended the virtual meeting, and uh, uh, this list of attendees included representatives from all Ryan White HIV program parts A through D, individuals from community-based agencies, and our federal partners, uh, uh, that included three HRSA bureaus and offices, uh, particularly the Bureau of Primary Health Care, the Maternal and Child Health uh, Bureau, and the Office of Women's Health, uh, as well as NIH. We also received a great deal of valuable input and idea, ideas for new actions and program investments around capacity building, technical assistance, and data-informed approaches to help improve wiki outcomes. HEP has been working with a contractor to assess the impact of six-month recertification requirements and rapid eligibility determination on Ryan White HIV AIDS programs. HEP has heard from many of you and uh, that six-month recertification is challenging for many reasons. A series of three TEPs were held to hear from a cross-section of Ryan White HIV AIDS program recipients about their challenges in implementing rapid eligibility determination and six month recertification in their programs. The results of this evaluation project are expected in late 2020 or early 2021. A TEP is planned for this October to examine the research, clinical and patient landscapes related to HIV prevention, treatment, support services, and community engagement for cisgender women across the lifespan. And finally, in November, a TEP is scheduled to explore ways Ryan White HIV AIDS program recipients and providers can meet the clinical and psychosocial needs of people aging with HIV. Uh, next slide, please. So in April, I'm going to actually, this, obviously, the slide states we're going to be talking about here the minority HIV AIDS fund initiatives. In April, have released funding opportunities for the three different uh, minority HIV AIDS fund SPINS initiatives. These initiatives seek to address the following challenges. The first, uh, the first uh, initiative is reducing stigma at systems, organizational, organizational, and individual client levels in the Ryan White. Uh, HIV AIDS program. This initiative established, uh, will establish a training and technical assistance program to reduce stigma for people with HIV on multiple levels throughout the healthcare delivery system, including on an individual client level. The second initiative, building capacity to implement rapid antiretroviral initiation for improved care engagement, evaluation and technical assistance provider uh, and this, uh, again, this NOFO uh, will implement and uh, evaluate rapid ART start interventions and facilitate TA to a cohort, cohort of implementation to promote a rapid start connection or accelerated entry into HIV medical care and rapid initiation of ART for people with HIV who are newly diagnosed, new to care, or out of care. And finally, the, the last is improving care and treatment coordination, focusing on black women with HIV. This is designed to implement and evaluate bundled interventions that will address sociocultural health determinants, expand the delivery and utilization of a comprehensive HIV care and, and treatment services, 
support continuous engagement in care, and improve health outcomes for Black women with HIV in a culturally sensitive and responsive manner. Funding for these initiatives will start September 1 of this year. I'm now going to uh, turn this presentation back over to Chrissy, who will introduce our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Well, that now concludes the first agenda item with all of the sub bullets. So we will now transition into the next presentation on the updated unmet need framework. As many of you are aware, HEP has been working for the past few years to update the framework that was developed to estimate unmet need which is one of our legislative requirements. So we awarded a contract to APT Associates to assist with this activity. We are excited that we now have an updated framework. So without further ado, I'm gonna now turn it over to Ms. Ann Rhodes. And Ms. Rhodes works at APT Associates on a number of Ryan White program evaluations. She previously worked at the Virginia Department of Health overseeing the statewide Ryan White and ADAP data systems and she has worked with Ryan White programs for over 25 years. So next slide, please. And I will now turn it over to um, Ms. Rhodes. Next slide again. Thank you. Great. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. OK, great. Um, so yeah, so I'm Ann Rhodes. As, thanks, Chrissy. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the updated framework for unmet need and um, some of the work that we did and what um, what's coming um, up in the next year or so. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to talk about, I'm going to do an overview, um, a really quick overview of the new framework, explain how recipients can prepare for implementation of the new framework, um, discuss the tools and resources that are going to be available, and I'll also highlight the next steps for training and technical assistance. Um, a lot of the information that I'll cover here is, gonna, is provided in more detail um, in the manual on unmet need, which I'll go over how to um, access that. Everything about unmet need is going to be posted on the Target HIV website, and it is actually up there, and I'm give you the web address at the end of this um, presentation. Next slide, please. Um, so the definition for unmet need, unmet need's been around since um, 2002 um, and is part of the Ryan White legislative requirements. Um, it's defined as the need for HIV related services by individuals with HIV who are aware of their HIV status but are not receiving regular primary HIV health care. Um, so I think most of, most of you are probably familiar um, with that definition. Um, next slide, please. Um, so um, have in the years since that original methodology went in place, there's been some changes, um, you know, changes in the treatment of HIV, um, with the advent of antiretroviral treatment. Um, and also there has been changes in the availability and quality of data used to estimate unmet need. Um, we have a lot more data than we did back in the early 2000s. Um, given this, HAB has been exploring ways to more effectively estimate unmet need, meeting both the legislative requirements um, and providing a better tool for jurisdictions to identify their needs and develop interventions in response to those needs. Next slide, please. Um, so there, as I mentioned before, there's a manual um, that goes into all the detail about unmet need. Um, this is a picture of the cover. Um, it includes background on the unmet need requirement, a summary of how changes to the methodology were determined, and it provides instructions for Ryan White Part A and Part B recipients on how to calculate unmet need using the new methodology. Um, and it, and I'll, I'll talk about how you can access this manual in just a few minutes. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about what's in the new methodology. Um, there are three required elements um, in this new unmet need framework. 
Um, and this is what recipients will be required to report to HRSA have. Um, the first one is late diagnoses. Um, that's the number of people with late diagnosed HIV in the jurisdiction based on the residence at time of diagnosis. Um, the second is unmet need or not in care, which is the number of people living with diagnosed HIV infection in the jurisdiction based on most recent known address without who have no CD4 or viral load test. And then the third element is in care and not virally suppressed is the number of people living with diagnosed HIV infection in the jurisdiction who are in care whose most recent viral load test was greater than or equal to 200 copies per milliliter. Um, next slide, please. So this is a more visual representation of um, how these, the required estimates and analyses for unmet need um, look. And I'll just um, take you through fairly quickly, um, and as I said, you can get a little more detail um, in the manual. Um, so recipients will look at, have to determine the number of new diagnoses. So if you look in the um, upper left-hand corner, there, there's a new diagnoses um, in a most recent calendar year. Um, and then using those, um, use the determine how many of those new diagnoses um, were late diagnosed. And then the same process for people living with diagnosed HIV infection, um, you start out with your population of people um, based on their most recent known address who are living with diagnosed HIV infection um, and determine how many are in care um, and how many have an unmet need um, based on whether they had um, CD4 counts or viral loads. And then of those in care, you determine how many are not, are in care, but not virally suppressed. Um, and using those, that definition for not virally suppressed of people who, um, whose last viral load was greater than or equal to 200 copies per milliliter. Um, now, there's one more step um, in the required estimates, um, which is looking at three specific target populations, which are determined by the jurisdiction, what those target populations are. And this slide just has some examples of potential target populations, um, young black MSM, older people, women of color, 25 to 34. Um, and you look, you, you'll report on what their um, unmet need markers look like. So they're late diagnoses, they're not in care, and they're um, not virally suppressed. Next slide, please. So what does this mean for recipients? Um, so beginning in fiscal year 2022, Ryan White Part A and Part B recipients will be required to submit unmet need estimates as part of the application um, in response to the notice of funding opportunity. Um, they'll need to use the required reporting templates um, as attachments in the application only the required estimates have to be submitted, but recipients can submit enhanced estimates if desired. Um, we'll talk more ab about enhanced estimates and those um, and how those are done. Um, they're in the manual and there will be some upcoming trainings um, and webinars to talk through um, the required and enhanced elements of unmet needs. There will also be narrative questions related to unmet need that will need to be addressed. The unmet need estimates will be required to be updated annually and submitted as part of the Part A NOFO and the Part B non-continuing, non-competing continuation. Next slide, please. Um, so all the technical assistance materials for unmet need are, are live on the Target HIV website now. So if you go to this address, um, at the Target HIV website, you can find um, the manual, the Excel files. Um, we've got an FAQ document up there, as well as an infographic on um, how to complete un the unmet need requirements. Um, so go, go check that out. Um, so that will give you a, a lot of information um, 
a little bit more in depth than what I just went through. Next slide, please. Um, we will be doing, um, we'll be getting ready to do webinars starting this fall. I think our first webinar will be in October and going through the spring of 2021. Um, these trainings will be for um, Ryan White staff as well as HIV surveillance staff as, as a lot of HIV surveillance data is used in doing these estimates. Um, we'll also have individual technical assistance available um, through the end of May 2021 that can be requested either through your HRSA project officer or directly um, via email um, at this email address um, on the screen, which is rw underscore unmet underscore need at appassociates.com. And that will also be on the target website to be able to request technical assistance. Next slide, please. Um, and just here's some contact information. So um, we've got a team at APP, myself, Debbie Eisenberg, and Tara Earl, who can help answer any questions that you have. Um, and then the HRSA HAB team, um, Andy, who's currently deployed, um, has really been the project lead, but there are also um, champions. We've um, gone over the whole unmet need framework with the HRSA HAB project officers and their senior advisors. Um, so for um, part A, it's, it's Helen and Andy, and then in part B, it's Kat Davies and yeah. Yemisi. So, um, Feel free to reach out with any questions you have and check out the Target HIV website for upcoming trainings. And thank you so much for your time. I'll no, hand wait. it back over to Chrissy. Thank you, Anne. Next slide, please. All right, so we're now going to transition. If I can just remind folks to please mute your phones, your lines, thank you. So now we're gonna to transition to our next uh, portion of the presentation. I'm gonna hand it over to Sarah Morgan um, for this next portion. Sarah. And Sarah, you can unmute because we do need to hear you. Okay. Hello everyone, <laughs> I'm unmuted now. Um, I'm Sarah Morgan, and I bring you greetings from my fellow project officers in the Division of Metropolitan HIV AIDS programs. Our current situation of having to meet the challenges of COVID-19 is hardly the first public health emergency we have all had to contend with. I remember being about seven years old, and maybe you're old enough to remember this also. Uh, I was seven years old, and I went with my whole family of nine people to the local high school cafeteria to swallow a little sugar cube that was the polio vaccine. That was my first experience with public health strategies in action. And since then, I and many of you have lived through smallpox, measles, chickenpox, and mumps, multiple floods, earthquakes, oil spills, the HIV AIDS pandemic, wildfires, the tragedies of 9-11 and the continuing health problems of the first responders to that horrific event, several serious hurricanes and tornadoes, several viruses and bacterial outbreaks such as MERS, Ebola, Zika, SARS, and H1N1, just to name a few. And now here we are with the COVID-19 pandemic. These public health emergencies prompted changes in how we take care of our families, our friends, and even our pets. And as public health professionals, they have prompted changes in how we conduct the business of tending to the health and safety of people with HIV and co-occurring conditions. Next slide, please. <laughs> Sorry. So when I think about the ways the Ryan White community has responded to this public health emergency, I think of Stephen R. Covey, author of a book that I'm betting most of us have read, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Covey famously said, to be successful, we must live from our imaginations, not from our memories. Here in HAB, 
We have been truly impressed and inspired by the myriad ways you, our recipients, providers, planning council and planning body members, clients and volunteers have responded to the challenge of COVID-19. You have implemented temporary and permanent changes to continue to serve people with HIV and your solutions have come with creativity, bravery, and sometimes desperation. We celebrate all of these changes and want to take this opportunity at our business meeting today to thank you for hanging tough in these challenging times. We have heard nobody throw up their hands and say, well, we can't operate in these conditions. There have been only a few temporary suspensions of services, but all were resolved more quickly than we thought possible. In the Division of Metropolitan HIV AIDS programs, we have been compiling a partial list of the accommodations and innovations you have made in order to share them with you. Thank you to all of you who sent them in in advance. You will be able to download a file compilation of the updated list on the Target HIV website after this conference. But also at the end of my presentation today, you'll have an opportunity to download the compilation that we have so far. Um, if you didn't send in a, a list in advance, we invite you now to share in the chat box today. Just be sure to include the name of your EMA or TGA, your role or agency type, your email address in case we have a question later, and a brief description of the change or innovation that you made. The changes, as I said before, could be permanent or temporary. Next slide, please. To recipients or program directors, we ask this question. What is one innovation or adjustment that your jurisdiction implemented during COVID-19 that will be continued after the emergency is over? Or, and we added this question later, what is one innovation or adjustment that your jurisdiction implemented due to COVID-19 that is strictly a temporary measure to help your program survive during the public health emergency? All of you converted to telehealth or virtual strategies in some way, and we expected that. We were more interested in learning about the barriers you overcame to get there. Did you have to change standards or service definitions? Did you have to reallocate funding to pay for technology? Did you have to change planning council bylaws to make achieving a virtual meeting quorum allowable? We realized that a program does not just turn on a dime and convert to vir virtual service delivery. Again, thank you to those who sent us in your responses, but everyone, please feel free to enter your responses in the chat box. And Deborah Medina and Marie and Duarte are watching the chat box for your, for your entry, so please feel free. Next slide, please. And to the Ryan White community, of recipient staff, providers, planning council and planning body members, clients and volunteers, we ask these questions. What is a change that works so well that you hope plan to retain it post pandemic? Or what is a change that worked on a temporary basis during the public health emergency? Next slide, please. As your responses came in, we began to loosely categorize them. This list is not inclusive at all, but it gives a general idea of the categories. I would like to go through these categories briefly and, and give you some examples. Perhaps they will spur additional ideas for you. First, food and housing. How to house people who need to practice social distancing. I think of one provider who talked about the changes they had to make to their food pantry. In order to keep clients safe, they had to stop the practice of letting people physically enter the pantry to shop and choose the food that they prefer. They started prepackaging bags of food. They put a code number on the bag and lined the bags up on a table outside of a closed service window. The clients would pass by the window outside of the pantry, pick up a bag, show the code and number to the staff member or volunteer safely behind the window, who could scan the number and the client's ID. They switched to no contact food delivery. They forfeited the client's ability to shop in order to keep everyone safe from the virus. A similar practice was implemented by AIDS Project of Greater Danbury, Connecticut, 
which did a similar thing in how they dispense harm reduction and prevention supplies. Moving on to health and safety. I think about the service category of medical transportation. Many of, the, of you told us about having to reduce the number of riders in buses or Uber cars because driving services will pick up only one rider at a time now and buses enforce social distancing. These measures mitigate the risk to clients, but they also drive up the cost of transportation to the Ryan White program. Staffing changes. See, on the uh, recipient level, many Part A staff have been detailed to work on COVID, leaving serious staffing shortages in the wake. How are you coping with this? Did you use volunteers? Did you switch to telehealth? Or did you simply rely on the remaining staff to pick up the slack? Fiscal changes. One of you reported a reduction in the cost of renting space to hold planning council meetings, as those meetings have shifted to Zoom. This savings was applied to the increased cost of transportation, as Uber and other car services will pick up only one person at a time. Technology. After your reading responses, I have to give a warm thank you to the smartphone. You are using the phone to solve so many challenges during this time. One common example is that your clients are taking photos or videos of themselves signing documents, such as a self-attestation of income form, and then texting the video to the provider. Simple and clever. Another quick example, the New York Planning Council bought electric electronic pads for loan to PC members who did not have them so they could see the data presentations for the PSRA process on something larger than a small phone. Policy changes. And you have made many temporary and permanent, permanent policy changes. I will start with HRSA HIV AIDS Bureau. We waived the requirement to conduct on-site annual site visits to, to uh, handle subrecipient monitoring. We expect you to con continue to monitor subrecipients, and you are doing just that, using your imaginations and ingenuity rather than lamenting that you can't do it the way you always did before. HRSA have also extended much flexibility in the due dates of various reporting requirements during this time. And many of you have managed to meet the original due dates anyway. On the recipient and provider side, you have made policy changes, many of them temporary, to keep programs operating. One Part A program is allowing providers to submit estimated invoices in order to ensure ongoing flow of funds and services. This doesn't eliminate the requirement for documentation and accuracy. It just gives the parties a little more time to amass their evidence, make adjustments, and submit for final approval, meanwhile keeping the money flowing. And there have been other innovations and combinations that do not fit into any of these categories. Next slide, please. I'm leaving my contact information with the hope that you will feel inspired to write with me with additional information about a change you have implemented, implemented in your program. And I want to acknowledge the work group that is compiling these data about Part A responses to COVID-19. Our leader, Lieutenant Commander Lawrence Mamadou, uh, Marie Ann Duarte, Deborah Medina, and all three branch chiefs, May Rupert, Sonia Hunt Gray, and Mark Pepler, all contributed to this work. And as I said earlier, we will update the list and post it on Target HIV. Next slide, please. And finally, on behalf of all of us in the Division of Metropolitan HIV AIDS programs, we thank you for your grace under pressure, your creativity, and your steadfast commitment to people with HIV. We salute you. I want to ask Marianne Duarte and Deborah Medina if there are contributions coming in through the chat box. Deborah? Uh, you have to unmute. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, I noticed. Yes, Sarah, good morning. Yes, uh, we have actually a, a contribution from Pamela Ogara. She had a question. Uh, did anyone purchase cell phones with data plans for Ryan White clients? to address digital divide? If yes, how did you do it since we cannot give Visa, MasterCard, or American Express gift cards to clients? Did anyone purchase cell phones with data plans for Ryan White clients to address 
blah, blah, blah. Okay, the, the, then Clover Barnes answered a minute after, she, uh, we paid the bill directly through the emergency financial assistance provider and purchased minute and cards for prepaid uh, phones, which Pamela thanks, thanked her. Uh, your response just gave me an idea that might work in my TGA. So basically, Thanks. yes, they, they, they solved the, the issue amongst themselves. Uh, we also had another question, uh, another uh, initiative from Tanya Madden from St. Louis City Department of Health. Uh, we have initiated a work from home policy throughout the Department of Health and with our providers and case managers. That also means developing a budget to supply telehealth equipment to some of our providers and staff. Great. And Sarah, I also want to share one from Philadelphia um, recipient. They said, they said to address the housing instability using COVID-19 funds, we have implemented an expanded emergency rental support program that not only pays overdue back rent, but supports PLWH for a short term with forward rent through a new program, the COVID-19 shallow rent emergency program. Housing is a major issue in Philadelphia and the COVID-19 shallow rent emergency program is a process that we will be looking to continue based on evaluation of the COVID-19 shallow rent emergency program. Um, this program will pay for the rent of PLWH who have lost income related to COVID-19 for three months Approved applicants will be recertified for an additional three months if they continue to meet the program's eligibility criteria. The program will pay up to $2,500 for the first three months and another $2,500 for a subsequent three months for a total of $5,000 possible per household for one six month period in a year. Payments go directly to the landlord. The emergency financial assistance program that has been in operation for many years will continue to cover first and last month's rent to help with clients move in costs, overdue back rent and utilities. So this is a collaborative effort with Hopwa COVID-19 dollars, which will cover overdue back rent, security deposits and mortgage payments. Uh, that, is, that is really wonderful and especially important as the uh, protections against uh, evictions are coming to an end or, or, or have ended. Uh, so this is very important. Is there anything else out there? Yes, uh, Sarah, Jennifer Carmona shared with us that they extended emergency financial assistance throughout the EMA. We helped the provider come up with referral protocols for this extension. That's in the New York EMA. Yes. Yay, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think another good one was also um, Philadelphia Planning Council. They have um, been in touch with uh, the positives. They said social isolation was a pre-existing issue for many people with HIV before COVID-19. And in an attempt to ameliorate the sense of isolation, weekly check-ins with positive community members via Zoom was instituted. So this is something they will continue in the future and it's hoped that through the social networks of participants and members that the check-in will increase over time. Mm -hmm. I had someone telling me about how in their support group for HIV positive people, uh, youth, they've been talking about thanking each other for wearing a mask to try to spread the uh, culture and idea that a mask is important and you should be thanked for doing it. To kind of get the word out, especially among the uh, young people that how important wearing a mask is. Yeah. Well, um, if Erica, if you can uh, post the Word file of the contributions we've had so far, and as I said, I will get it updated with any information that comes out to me in the next, today, in the next couple of weeks, and we'll post a final list on the Target Center. We just heard from a few today, and there are many, many other innovations out there. And then I will pass it on to the next speaker, who is Chrissy. Thank you, everybody.
Thank you, Sarah and the team for th that presentation. And um, it was so nice to see some of that peer-to-peer -peer TA going on in the chat box and just sharing of all of these ideas that's going to assist us as we move forward. Um, next slide, please. So we're gonna move on to our last portion of our presentation today, which is our DMAP 30th year celebration of the Ryan White HIV AIDS program. So I am now going to turn it over to Mr. Kia Hudson to lead us through this presentation. Dear Kia. Thank you so much, Chrissy. I'm so excited to be here. Um, and good afternoon to everyone. If you're on the East Coast, good afternoon. If you're on the West Coast, good morning. Um, as you may know, this is the 30th year of the Ryan White HIV AIDS program. And as the week goes on, this theme will be highlighted throughout. We here in DMAP wanted to highlight some of the key events that have taken place leading up to the formerly known Ryan White Care Act, now known as the Ryan White HIV AIDS Treatment Modernization Act. This afternoon, we will um, walk you through some history of the Ryan White HIV AIDS program as well as test your knowledge of HIV history with a fun trivia game. As we walk through memory lane, please feel free to share any important memories that you know may spark in your brain um, in the chat box as it relates to the HIV epidemic, the Ryan White HIV AIDS program, or your program in specific. We would like this to be as interactive as possible. So I am going to turn it over to Deborah uh, Medina to get us started. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Drukia. Uh, let's get started with our first trivia question. We want to play this as if it were Jeopardy. We will ask a question and would like you to type in your answers as if answering on Jeopardy. For example, this conference happens every two years and is the leading conference on care and treatment on HIV and AIDS. The answer would be, what is the National Ryan White Conference on Care and Treatment? So let's play. Trivia question number one. The next slide. Okay, perfect. The question is, in 1986, these four hardest hit cities were awarded HRSA's first aid service demonstration grants. The first option will be what are Baltimore, New York, Miami, and San Francisco? B, what are New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Miami? C, what are Los Angeles, Dallas, New York, and Baltimore? Okay, and polling? Perfect. 74% got the correct answer, which is what are New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Miami? Thank you very much. Let's uh, go on to the next slide, please. On June 5, 1981, the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention published a morbidity and mortality weekly report describing the cases of a rare lung infection, pneumocystis carini pneumonia or PCP, in five young, previously healthy gay men in Los Angeles. This edition of the MMWR marked the first official reporting on what would later become known as AIDS. The number of cases continued to grow as the CDC refined their case definition and scientists learned more about the virus. We will begin this journey in the years before the passage of the Ryan White Care Act, starting with 1986, the year in which the AIDS service demonstration grants marked HRSA's first AIDS-specific health initiative making funds available to four of the country's hardest hit cities in its first year, New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Miami. On March 30, 1987, the Food and Drug Administration approved Cidobudin or AZT, the first anti-HIV approved for drug for use in the United States. Soon thereafter, HRSA launched its ACT drug reimbursement program, which brought treatment to people who lacked resources to acquire ACT on their own. 
and laid the foundation for the AIDS Drug Assistance Program, or ADAP. The Pediatric AIDS Demonstration Grants were awarded beginning in 1988. These grants made a whole new level of care available to families, especially to children, and became the framework for Title IV or Part D of the CARE Act for women, children, infants, and youth, or WIKI. In fiscal year 1989, HERSA appropriated a total of 3.9 million in low prevalence planning grants to 22 grantees. These grants were among the first eight specific resources in some locations. These grants set the stage for building a care continuum outside the large urban epicenters where HIV AIDS first emerged. Next slide, let's move to our second trivia question. Let's uh, pull the question, please. The second question is, in 1994, the Food and Drug Administration approved the first US HIV test system using oral fluid samples. A, what is Sorasure HIV, HIV-1, B, what is Soraquic, C, what is Samba HIV-1, Q test. The correct answer, okay, let's end the poll. Perfect. 54% got the correct answer, which is, what is Orasure HIV-1? Next slide, please. On August 18, 1990, the Congress passed the groundbreaking Ryan White Comprehensive AIDS Resources Emergency Care Act. At the time, the CARE Act was, and remains today, unique among the nation's health pro healthcare programs and one of the only a few disease-specific health programs in the country. Ryan White was an Indiana teenager with hemophilia who contracted AIDS through a blood transfusion. He courageously fought AIDS-related discrimination and helped educate the nation about his disease. Herschel distributed its first Care Act grants in April 1991, ensuring that funds were spent locally in a manner that would achieve the greatest impact. Herschel's Bureau of Health Professions provided training throughout the, through the AIDS Education and Training Centers program early in the epidemic and continued to do so until 1997, when the program was funded through the Care Act. With eight incidents and mortality skyrocketing, seven more metropolitan regions became eligible for Title I or Part A funding as eligible metropolitan areas or EMAs in 1993. Many elements made the Title I program unique among other Ryan White HIV program initiatives. For example, uh, local planning council established spending priorities for the jurisdiction, and the priorities were based on needs assessments among the local HIV positive population. In 1994, findings from the AIDS clinical trial group 076 demonstrated that with a particular regimen of ACT, the incidence of perinatal HIV transmission plummeted from 22.6 to 7.6%. In a development that would forever change the HIV AIDS treatment landscape, the FDA approved an open label study of Sakinavir in June 1995. The first drug of its kind to be made available outside ongoing clinical trials, Sakinavir, is a protease inhibitor. On December 6, just six months later, Sakinavir was approved for use in combination with other nucleoside analog medications. The age of combination therapy had arrived. Highly active antiretroviral therapy, or HART, became widely available to people living with HIV AIDS in 1996. Its morbidity and mortality fell almost immediately in the industrialized world, and the way we think about AIDS changed forever. I will now leave you with Marian Duarte, who will guide us through the next decade. Marian? 
Hi. Next slide, please. It's the poll. Can you please put up the poll? In 1996, this researcher was named Times Man of the Year for recognizing the dynamic nature of HIV replication in the body and being an early proponent of combination antiretroviral therapy, including use of protease inhibitors. A, who is David Ho? B, who is Stephen Young? C, who is Dr. Anthony Fauci? Please go ahead and submit your answers. Gonna let it go for another couple seconds. Please close the poll and so show the results. So the answer is actually, who is David Ho? Thank you. Next slide, please. Nineteen ninety six was a big year and brought reauthorization, keeping the programs alive for another five years. It was also the last time the entire AIDS quilt was shown on the mall in DC. In 1997, HRSA consolidated four bureaus into one named the HIV AIDS Bureau. This would enable a better focus on health disparities, pooling of clinical care training and technical assistance resources, and fewer administrative costs for grantees receiving multiple lines of Ryan White HIV AIDS program funding. After years of a disproportionate rising of AIDS cases in Black and Hispanic communities, African-American leaders requested, and in October of 1998, President Clinton declared HIV AIDS a, quote, severe and ongoing health care crisis, end quote, affecting racial and ethnic minorities, and he announced the Congressional Black Caucus Initiative. Now, that newly minted Congressional Black Caucus got busy quickly and began the Minority AIDS Initiative in fiscal year 1999. Congress responded by allocating $156 million to fund minority AIDS initiative efforts. 2000 saw another reauthorization and new sections of the law targeting people with HIV who were not receiving appropriate services. There was also increased emphasis on better health outcomes. Next poll, please. Thank you. In 2004, the FDA approved the first CLIA-waived HIV diagnostic test kit using oral fluid samples that provides screening results with over 99% accuracy in as little as 20 minutes. A, what is Samba HIV-1 semi-Q test? B, what is OraQuick rapid HIV-1 antibody test? C, what is none of the above? Please submit your answers. Okay, we can close the poll and show those results. That's right. Or a quick, what is or a quick rapid HIV-1 antibody test? Next slide, please. A guide to the clinical care of women with HIV AIDS published by HRSA in 2001 is now the main textbook across the globe on the treatment of women with HIV. It was the first manual written specifically on the medical treatment of women with HIV. In this year, HIV infection was the fifth leading cause of death among women between ages 25 and 44 in the US. Now the second bullet alludes to the HRSA CDC International Training and Education Center on HIV or ITEC. It would help hard hit countries in the Caribbean, Africa and Asia to create self-sustaining healthcare worker training systems. The United States Leadership Against Global HIV AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria Act of 2003 was signed into law creating the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, also known as PEPFAR. HRSA's Global AIDS Program was established as part of PEPFAR implementation. This would be the largest monetary con commitment by any country for a single disease, 15 billion over a five year period. In 2004, PEPFAR's Track 1.0 antiretroviral therapy program 
is launched in partnership with ministries of health in 13 countries. At the same time, the Institute of Medicine stated that a single index was needed to calculate severe need for all funding applicants. So HRSA convened more than 47 panelists and examined more than 56 variables for possible consideration. In 2005, the SPINS buprenorphine initiative ramps up, allowing 10 HIV AIDS care providers across the country to move one step closer to a seamless and comprehensive care system by combating the barriers to HIV AIDS care that drug addiction poses. Those providers were in Providence, Rhode Island, Tucson, Arizona, Chicago, Illinois, Baltimore, Maryland, Bronx, New York, Oakland, California, Portland, Oregon, San Francisco, California, Miami, Florida, and New Haven, Connecticut. And with that, I will turn it over to Dirkia. Thanks, Maria. All right, next slide, please. All right, we're gonna go into trivia question number five. In 2009, all Ryan White HIV uh, program recipients and service providers began reporting client level information on all clients served during a calendar year to the HIV AIDS Bureau. Um, A, what is the Ryan White program data report or the RDR? What is the Ryan White HIV AIDS program service report or the RSR? And then C, what is all of the above? I'll give you a few, a few seconds to put in your answers. All right, uh, we could close the poll. The correct answer is B. What is the Ryan White HIV AIDS, um, um, sorry, program service report or the RSR? Next slide, please. In December of 2006, the Ryan White uh, Care Act is renamed to the Ryan White HIV AIDS Treatment Modernization Act of 2006. The Ryan White Treatment uh, Modernization Act bill was passed in 2007, produced widespread changes, including the Ryan White HIV AIDS program grantees under certain parts, including Part A, must demonstrate that they are spreading I'm uh, sorry, spending at least 75% of the funds on core medical services. One of the most important changes to the Ryan White HIV AIDS Part, Part A program is the creation of an entirely new program, Transitional Grant Areas, better known to you all as TGAs. Five new mid-sized cities like Indianapolis, Nashville, Charlotte, Phoenix, and Memphis are classified as TGAs with the populations of 50,000 or more and who have between 1,000 to 1,999 AIDS cases reported in the last five years. 2008 brought an opportunity for HRSA to address incarceration among people with HIV. At that time, one in four people with HIV had been in correctional facilities at some point in their lives. In response, HRSA's AETCs released a series of educational videos on HIV care in correctional settings and HRSA spends continued their work on the enhancing linkages of HIV primary care and services in jail settings initiatives. The Ryan White HIV AIDS Treatment Extension Act of 2009 contained implicit guidance to the HIV AIDS Bureau or HAB to collect client level data or name based data, a huge shift for the HIV AIDS community. Recipients and service providers began completing the Ryan White HIV AIDS Program Service Report, or the RSR, as you know it, detailing information on all the clients served during a calendar year, eliminating aggregate data reporting. 2010 saw the celebration of the tw 20 years since the Ryan White Care Act was passed into law. In 20 years, the, the program went from 220,550,000 um, million five hundred fifty thousand in 1991 to $2.29 billion in funding, the largest, largest appropriations for the program since the program's inception. Also in 2010, the first ever national HIV AIDS strategy was unveiled. Next slide, please. All right, so we have trivia question number six. In 2012, the FDA approved the use of this medication for reducing risk 
of HIV infection in uninfected individuals at high risk, marking the first HIV treatment to be approved for pre-exposure prophylaxis or better known as PrEP. Please, um, well, I'll give you the options. Option A, what is Triomec? Um, option B, what is Trisavir? And option C, what is Travada? Please put your votes in. All right, we can close the poll. With 96% of the people voting, you have the correct answer. It is what is Travada? Next slide, please. Two thousand and eleven marked the thirtieth year since AIDS was first recognized as a public health concern in nineteen eighty one. As of June two thousand and eleven, more than six hundred thousand people had died from AIDS in the United States. However, July two thousand and eleven marked the one year anniversary of the National HIV AIDS Strategy, which outlined bold steps to addressing the domestic HIV epidemic. In two thousand and twelve, HAB laid emphasis on CARES prevention. New research told us that test and treat can work and studies also pointed out an important tenant to making care prevention, getting people into treatment as early as possible, even when their immune systems are still relatively healthy. In 2013, HRSA strongly supported HIV impact prevention and several high impact provision, prevention efforts were underway in the Ryan White HIV AIDS program communities all across the nation. HAB also focused on linkage and retention in care to support high impact prevention, continuing funding under SPINS for populations at high risk for HIV infection initiative, projects to improve linkages to testing and treatment on a statewide scale. The continuum of engagement and care or later known um, or later changed to the HIV care continuum was phrased by Dr. Laura Cheever, uh, HRSA's associate administrator for the HIV AIDS Bureau in her seminal 2007 editorial to describe the fluid nature of HIV care um, delivery and patient experience. That concept of, of engaging patients and moving them along the HIV care continuum to achieve and sustain viral load suppression has received unprecedented attention and led to a federal HIV care continuum initiative in which the Ryan White HIV AIDS program plays a critical role. In 2015, we celebrated 25 years of the Ryan White Care Act, the legislation that created the Ryan White HIV AIDS program. With 25 years of providing comprehensive care for people with HIV. In the summer of 2015, an event at the White House entitled, entitled Moving Forward with Care, building on 25 years of passion, purpose, and excellence, celebrated the achievements of the Ryan White HIV AIDS program, honored the life of Ryan White, and looked back at the historical efforts to pass the landmark legislation. Now I'm going to turn it over to Sonia Hunt Gray to round us out on some of these significant events that have happened in the last five years. Okay, thank you very much, Jakia. Next slide, please, which is a trivial question. Question number seven, would you please put the question up, please? In 2020, HAB funded selected states and counties to implement effective, you guys have already gotten the answer, effective and innovative strategies, interventions, approaches, and services to reduce new HIV infections in the United States by 90% by 2030. The first possible answer would have been A, what is building capacity, colon, the plan for America, B, what is ending the HIV epidemic, colon, a plan for America? Or C, what is getting to zero? So we'll let you guys play around with the poll a minute and we'll go to the answer. We can end the poll. And the answer is yes, within two seconds. What is ending the HIV epidemic, a plan for America? Thank you very, thank you very much. Next slide, please. Slide. <laughs> Thank you. So as we continue, as Derkia said, memory lane, and as you think about the contributions that you made across the, the, the continuum of, of time, we are now looking at 
2016 to 2020, which is optimizing health outcomes. In 2016, HRSA's efforts to achieve the goals of the National HIV AIDS Strategy was the priority. We released the 2015 uh, Ryan White HIV AIDS Program Annual Client Level Data Report. We invested in new initiatives that addressed uh, hepatitis C virus. We promoted public leadership for people living with HIV in 2016. And we had our landmark 2016 National Ryan White Conference on HIV care and treatment, which we uh, had 2016, 18, and now 2020. In 2017, we remain focused on the co-infections um, of with HIV and hepatitis C, and uh, we made, we made sure that we had proper funding to look at that so that we could begin eliminating HIV and HCV as co-infections as one of our major goals during 2017. Our next, our next uh, year, important year, was 2018, which we again had our National Ryan White Conference. And during that event, the annual Ryan White Data Report, colon, Ryan White HIV AIDS Program Services Report 2017 was released at that conference. This particular report, this particular report. Uh, I'm on now. Yeah, for you on there, but your name not listed. Okay, I'll, I'll, uh, this particular report outlined um, the one that with Dr. Fauci and him that started calendar years 2013 through 2017. In 2019, HRSA plays a leading role in ending the HIV AIDS epidemic, and we mentioned just a, a minute ago. So we have our Ryan White AIDS, uh, HIV AIDS program working uh, in conjunction with our uh, funded um, healthcare centers so that we can, which they have a long history of delivering quality HIV care as we do to most at-risk populations. And these programs will focus on three, on four key strategies in ending the HIV AIDS epidemic. And that's diagnose, treat, prevent, prevent re and respond. I wanted to go back to 2018 if I could and just highlight again, uh, in 2018, 87.1% of Ryan White HIV AIDS program clients were virally suppressed in 2018, again, exceeding the national average of 62.7%. And that's something just to, to, to continue to highlight. And as we look at 2020, we're in a global health pandemic and we have all been responding and we appreciate all the work and hard work that you all have done on a local level to address this global health pandemic, uh, coronavirus, COVID-19. Um, and in April, uh, 20, April 15, 2020, uh, HHS through HRSA awarded $90 million to the Ryan White HIV AIDS program to prevent, prepare for and respond to the coronavirus disease, COVID-19. And th this is what you, uh, have done. And we appreciate a lot of the um, uh, sharing that, that you did earlier in terms of some of the, the uh, processes that have worked and that you may continue uh, to do. But the funding was so that you can continue maintaining quality care uh, with our HIV AIDS uh, clients in your local jurisdictions. So now we have from uh, um, another question, question number eight. Here's the question. How long have you been actively involved in the HIV community? Looks like we have uh, normalizing of the polls. So we have folks 
from zero to five years all the way to 25 to 30 years of dedication. And we really appreciate that. And so the next question that we wanted to ask everyone, and we would like for you to please place your answer in the chat room was what's next? If you could do the next slide, please. What's next? Where will, we, where will we be in the next five to 10 years? So if you could take a minute and use your best um, analysis and, and, and work and vision and share with us uh, uh, what's next? Where will we be in the next five to 10 years? And so if, uh, someone looking at the chat room, if you could, uh, oh, a cure. Thank you, Luigi. Another one, Samantha, thank you, a cure. No new infections. Thank you, Dylan. Vaccine, a cure, a vaccine. Uh, that one was important that black women will not be stigmatized. No new infections, getting to zero from Fran and Louisiana. And we thank you all for, uh, again, just to summarize, a cure, a vaccine, uh, getting rid of stigma, ending the epidemic, and no infection. So we just appreciate the fact, oh, from homelessness to housing. So all of these things, we can get there. I mean, if you, depending on when you started, uh, and I started working uh, many years ago in the 80s where there was just AZT. So I was able to go down memory lane all the way to present and to see that we're getting to ending the HIV AIDS epidemic is phenomenal. And we're so uh, thankful to you guys for all of the hard work that you've done so that we could be here today. So thank you very much. Next slide, please. We have a link for additional information uh, with the living history that we put together and more uh, in the information that we, that we shared. But I would like to now um, ask for final words from our division director, Ms. Chrissy Abrams Woodland. Thank you, Chrissy. Thank you. Thank you to the team who put together that presentation. That was fun. Um, it was a nice reflection and walking us through the years and also um, a little humor. So we like to shout out to Stephen Young, our previous director, that was great. Yes, and while we do here in DMAP for you all, we do hold him in high esteem. So yes, he indicated we put him up against some hefty competition, but we do hold him in high regard. Next slide, please. So actually this concludes our 2020 National Right and White Conference DMAP Business Day meeting. We actually are finishing a few minutes early, so we'll give you um, a little extra time in between now and the plenary, which will be starting at 1.30. So you all can grab a snack and take a quick break and stretch your legs, and then we will reconvene for the true kickoff of the 2020 National Ryan White Conference with our opening plenary. So I just want to first thank um, our work group um, under the leadership of Lieutenant Commander Lawrence Mamadou for all of their work ensuring that this meeting was a success. You know, we've had to revise the agenda, the presentations and the content to accommodate the virtual format and the shortened time slot. So it was a lot of work in a fairly short amount of time, but what an outstanding job was done. So thank you all to all of the work group members. Um, and that is uh, Lawrence, Sarah, Marie and Christina, Deborah, Durkia, Luigi, Andy, Helen, Mark, May and Sonia. I think I got them all, but if I happen to have left anyone off, please, uh, my apologies, but a huge thank you to you. Um, also want to thank our um, non-work group members and presenters who participated today. Michael, thank you for being available at the last hour and jumping in, um, as well as Anne from our APT Associates. Um, also want to thank our non-work group chat monitors. Um, I saw some participants, some responses from our um, division team that was helping to assist Amy and I saw from Lenny and for all everyone who just participated as well and even um, Debbie from APT. Thank you for monitoring the chat and responding to questions. Um, as you can tell, this was truly a division-wide effort and so I just thank you. 
And um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, the peer-to-peer -peer TA that was going on in the chat box. That was awesome. So thank you all for not, even, not only joining us today, but being active participants. And that's what makes this work, this virtual conference and platform work. So we thank you for being with us this morning. Um, we hope that you enjoyed our presentation today, our business day meeting. As I mentioned um, during the opening, we will continue to have some DMAP um, specific webinars in the coming months to really provide some detailed updates on some of the new changes and activities that will be taking place in DMAP. So stay tuned and be on the lookout for that. Um, again, thank you to our jurisdictions, our party jurisdictions for participating today and continuing to provide high quality HIV care and treatment and services to those most in need. Um, especially during these trying times with this COVID-19 pandemic that we are living in. Um, it's, it's been um, tremendous to work with each of you and to hear what you all are doing and sharing, and we will continue to be a support to you here on the federal side and continue to be here as your listening ear and to provide you with any resources we possibly can and to help assist during this time. So we will now take our break and before we transition to the opening plenary, again, I sincerely hope you enjoyed our business day meeting today and the remainder of the conference. And finally, on our last slide is just some information on how you can connect with HRSA. So you can learn more about our agency at www.hrsa.gov, and you can also sign up for our HRSA e-news there. And there's also all of our social media accounts as well. So again, thank you all. And this concludes our DMAP Business Day for the 2020 National Ryan White Conference. Enjoy.